there was an evil entity in the house. You are about to see real people. I was terrified beyond belief. Reliving horrifying paranormal encounters for the first time. I truly felt it was like living in hell. I felt like I wasn't alone. Literally grabbed me and spun in and bang up on the wall. When ghosts are invited into their lives. I buried this for nearly 30 years. Be prepared to be afraid. Take one. In 1988, I was living with my husband and my one and two year old daughters. We had just left a small basement apartment, so we were pretty excited to be able to move into a, a three bedroom split level house. It was um, kind of like a dream come true at the time. The young family was just settling into their new life when Kat was contacted by someone she hadn't heard from in over a year. Maria was a friend of mine, it just out of the blue, and there was no call display then. I just, the phone rang, and I answered it, and it, it was her. Huh? There was this hysterical person on the other end saying, I need your help. And what really got me was when she said, they're going to kill us. Well, she arrived on my doorstep with her son. She was a mess. She was disheveled. She was pale. And immediately she's going, I know you don't know me that well, but I always trusted you, and I knew that you would help me. So I let her in. She began to open up to me about what had been happening. Maria and Kat sat down to catch up on the past 12 months. But every word that came out of Maria's mouth, Kat found horrifying. She said, my husband joined a cult. When Maria got pregnant, her husband made an appalling confession. Halfway through the pregnancy, he said, we have to leave here. I've done something really bad, we have to go. She said, when I had an ultrasound and found out I was having a boy, he promised that boy to the cult as a sacrifice. It took me a while to even process what was being said to me. Maria told Kat she was scared, but didn't really believe she or her baby were in danger. All that changed at her husband's birthday party eight months earlier, just after the baby had been born. They had had a a birthday party. And then she said, I remember hearing my sister screaming, and I'm realizing I'm drugged. He's drugged us. She said, there were these people in my apartment. And she said, I remember robes. I remember these black robes. And there was a fight, a physical altercation. <laughs> She told me, I get up, finally I can walk, but I'm still really dopey. And she goes, there's this knife in my kitchen sink, covered in blood. She goes, and I don't know why, I just started washing this knife. She goes, and then I look over, and my husband's in this industrial garbage bag, and I can see his arm is over, his head hanging out of the garbage bag. His throat had been cut from ear to ear, nearly decapitated him. And she said, I made it back to the couch and passed out. When she woke up, that garbage bag was gone. He was gone. And they found him in a field across from the apartment. She said, people at the funeral home, they're all trying to say, well, he committed suicide. No, he didn't. 
Maria's brutal tale did not finish with her husband's death. It was just the beginning. She began to tell me that shortly after the funeral, and actually someone called during the funeral and told her, it's not over. We're owed. That baby is ours. He was promised to us, and we want him. And I said, what have you involved me in? Despite her reservations, Kat felt she had no other option but to invite Maria and her son to move in. It would turn out to be the worst decision of her life. I had no clue what was being brought or, or entering my life or my, my husband's life or, most importantly, the lives of my children. Usually people, when they get into the occult, there are attachments that will attach themselves to those individuals. And that individual spirit can move and manifest to another individual. Because you have to remember, there's a different level of energy that's playing here, a different mindset that's playing here. And the mindset that I want to take over, the mindset that I want to empower, the mindset that I want to control. And they'll take that opportunity and they'll cause havoc with that person. Shortly after Maria had arrived, um, really some strange things had started happening. Um, I would put the children's toys away before bed. My husband would get up in the morning and the toys would be all out of the chest. And he'd say, what are you doing? Like, why do you always put them away? Someone's gonna trip. And I said, but I did. I did put them away. Life had been completely normal before Maria arrived. Kat now became convinced the strange events were linked to her friend. She feared that by taking Maria in, she had also invited in the spirit of Maria's dead husband. I had hung pictures that I liked. Some of them were very old pictures, I should tell you, so I loved them, but they would be off of the wall. Some of them were smashed on the floor, like someone had just walked by and, and hit them and knocked them off. But it's very painful, actually, was finding my wedding picture shredded. The glass was shattered, the picture is shredded. It was the last straw. Reluctantly, Kat told Maria she had to leave. But any hopes that the weird events would stop were soon dashed in brutal fashion. smell arrived in my house. I was in the kitchen between dishes, and I smelled this smell of rot, of decay. And all of a sudden, and I could feel my feet being pulled apart. This thing was going to have me. In inviting a troubled friend into her home, Kat Larston had also allowed a malevolent spirit to enter, and it was becoming increasingly violent. The smell arrived in my house. I was in the kitchen between dishes, and I smelled this smell of rot, of decay. And all of a sudden, I felt something against me. I couldn't move. And I could feel my feet being pulled apart. This thing was going to have me. I was trying to call for help. 
and I couldn't move. <laughs> my husband saw my hips the next day and I had bruises, just black. And he said, oh my God, like, did you fall or what happened? And I said, no, I was, I, said I was attacked. I just want to go have a bath. I just want to bathe. But for Kat, nowhere was safe. I feel this hand. It literally, the fingers were on either side of my, the tops of my ears, and it pushes me under the water. <laughs> I remember going, I have to get out of here. To tell him I have to get out, I have to get out. <laughs> I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die here. I remember thinking, oh. just kill me. Just kill me. The attack stopped as suddenly as it started. Having just survived one of the most terrifying experiences of her life, Kat tried to block it out of her mind and move on. Hey, Sarge, we got another one here. Another one what here? Several nights later, I had put my children to bed, and I'm trying to watch TV, but I'm thinking about what happened. Cat was confronted by an enormous shadow figure. It literally filled the entire door. Black. This thing was massive. And I'm thinking, oh my god. Oh my God, because I could smell the rot and it just charged at me. Once again, just as Kat thought she could take no more, the attack suddenly stopped. With her husband away, Kat was terrified of being in the house with just her young daughters. She asked her mother to come over. My mom was coming over. Hi. How are you? And so I had this um, big floral picture I had put up, and I'm standing there talking to my mom, and it just flies off of the wall and smashes. And all of a sudden, something's got me. <laughs> literally grabbed me and spun and then bang up on the wall. And my feet come up off the floor and the nail where the picture is hung, I'm slammed against the wall and it's pulling me down and the nail is gouging my back and my mom is screaming, what's happening? What's happening? What's going on? And I said, it's going to kill me. I was just sobbing. I just said, it's going to kill me. You have to go. Take the girls. I said, just go. Just go. It's, it doesn't want you. It wants me. <laughs> and I called my husband at work, and I said, I am done. I'm done. I'm done. I can't stay here, I can't live here anymore, I can't do this. I packed up my kids as much as I could grab in a quick amount of time and myself and I left. I went to my mom's. I 
I did call Maria's dad and I said, I need to talk to her. There's more to this. I need to talk to her. And her dad goes, so, you know, this is it. I mean, after today, don't come back. If you come back, what's been happening to you will get worse. When that individual finds out the person it, it came from, where the initial um, entry point came in their lives, when they confront that person, they're technically confronting the entity at the same time because that attachment is feeding off them. I don't even recognize the face on this girl, and she's wringing her hands. They said, I'll always love you, but I can't ever see you again. They said, please, before he kills one of my kids, please. This is your problem. I said, you know, you should have never brought this to my home, to me. And I'm thinking maybe it was just a warning to me. Maybe it's over. It was over for Kat. After seeing Maria that final time, the attack stopped, and Kat's family went on to live a normal life. I buried this for nearly 30 years. We don't even talk about it, my husband and I. He was really afraid that I might trigger something by talking to you. Invitations to entities from the dark side are not easily revoked. Once a door is opened, the spirit world has a habit of sticking around. Story 19, take one, marker. After struggling with some health issues, Dustin Terry had been looking for a new and cheaper apartment for him and his son Austin to move into. What attracted me to the building was the location. It was listed and it was fairly cheap in the paper, so I decided to call and check on it. The building looked like your older classic uh, brick building with the old iron gate that still had the old wood that used to be the outside of the um, siding. You know, it's kind of like stepping back in history almost. I did not take my son with me to see the place at all. He actually just kind of got a surprise one day. He thought it was cool because it was so close to grandma, my mom. Yeah, it's less than a five minute walk for him in a nice area. I was hoping in this new place for a fresh start, basically. I was downstairs doing a little bit of laundry. The feeling I felt was just like you were being watched. I just blew it off as no big thing. there's something there as to what, I don't know. <sighs> Dustin Terry had just moved into his new apartment when he started feeling like he was not alone. I was downstairs doing a little bit of laundry. The feeling I felt was just like you were being watched. I 
I was actually in the back part of my house. I was folding my clothes, and it sounded like someone opened my door and started walking into my house. seen no one there it was mainly confused there's just no way to explain it really i did not think about wanting to tell my son anything i didn't want to bring that to his attention at that young of an age dustin had started to feel increasingly paranoid in his home he didn't want to tell his son austin about his experiences for fear of frightening him but the unwanted visitor left him with no choice I was at home. We were sitting down in the living room, and one can out of the middle fell off. And I'm like, OK, it's nothing. Nothing at all. I pick it up, I put it back up there, I start watching TV, and within 15 minutes again, the same can that I just picked off the floor falls down again. I was still confused. I still didn't want to admit it because I was still along the lines of these are older apartments. I was like, no, it's got to be something that's very explainable. It's, it just has to be. When uh, spirits do things like pushing cans off the shelf repeatedly the same thing or open a door the same thing, it's their sense of letting them know, letting the physical people know I'm still here, I still exist, and that their process is I still can do these things. Dustin put the events out of his mind and tried to get on with his life. His girlfriend of six months started staying over at his apartment. My girlfriend would come over uh, usually once a weekend. I was watching TV. She said that someone just walked in and someone just touched me on my back. So now it's starting to get physical, and now I know I have a major problem on my hands. Worried about a possible intruder, Dustin started searching the rest of the apartment. said it was just kind of eerie odd. She just felt a presence, like someone was standing behind her, and she didn't seem too comfortable at that point in time. I know there's something there as to what, I don't know. Dustin decided the strange incidents were putting his son and his girlfriend at risk, and he needed help. I needed to look for someone to come in and do something, so I called in a priest from the Catholic Church in St. Joe. Like, well, I think that a house blessing will help you, and I think we should start one. So I said, okay. So without him knowing about it right away, I grabbed my cell phone and turned on voice record, and I put it in my back pocket just to see. He starts with a couple of prayers, and he's reading from the scriptures as he walks through, and he does the holy water routine in every room. We get back towards the back area, and I noticed when he got back there, he was a little bit hesitant. I 
kind of monitored when they did leave that they were still pretty much looking around quite a bit. It wasn't like I had his 100% attention. It's like something else had his attention on the side. Dustin was not convinced the blessing had worked. After the priest had left, I decided to take the audio and transfer it over to my laptop. Justin Terry and his young son, Austin, had moved into a new apartment, but so far, it had not been a happy home. <laughs> Dustin felt that someone or something was sharing their space, and he had called in a priest to do a blessing. After the priest had left, I decided to take the audio and transfer it over to my laptop. priest was talking. It was pretty quiet. You didn't hear anything. But whenever the priest would seem to want to start talking from the scriptures or do any kind of a blessing, when he would stop, there's this very specific And when he starts, it stops. And the minute he stops, it starts back up again. In the name of the Father. Something's talking back to him and doesn't want him here. The Son and the Holy Ghost. After I heard the recording, you know, I I was in a predicament as, do I stay or go? I'm very tired of not feeling comfortable, uh, tired of not knowing if my kid's going to be all right in the middle of the night, or if he has seen more and he's just not telling me because I don't think that's a very good environment for a 12-year-old. It didn't take long for Dustin's doubts about the blessing to be proved correct. One day, me and my son were coming up out of the basement from the laundry room. You hear a whisper again. You know, you can hear some footsteps. And we made it to the stop step. And we stepped onto the carpeting, and there was clearly ch -ch 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 coming up. I didn't want to tell him anything. I just said, let's go. When you can't see something and you can hear the noise obviously going on, it's very, one of the most scariest things I think I've ever actually really been through. After the footsteps and everything going on, I knew I needed to look for someone to come in and do something. So I reached out to Lori to the Paranormal Society. I could tell in his voice that he was scared, and it, it was a very disturbing experience that he had been having. But the more people that I talked to and found out that I'm not the only one that was having these experiences. Lori and her team started an investigation into the apartment building and spoke with Dustin's neighbors. A lot of these older buildings, like the one Dustin lives in, were motels, and they were converted into nowadays apartments. So whatever happened in the motels, you're going to get what is called residual entities that are still there. You're going to get residual feelings, emotions in the building, and it, it's like glue to a wall. A lot of people who cross over are afraid to cross over, and they'll stay here. They'll stay with that opportunity in order to, to fulfill that sensation that they're still alive somehow. I had heard other stories from other people in the building. 
I figured back in the 1930s and 40s, somebody had opened a portal in there via a Ouija board and brought this thing through it and they did not close off the Ouija board and now these poor people that are in Dustin's building, not only him, have to deal with us. When I first moved in and had these suspicions, I didn't think it'd get this bad, but as it progressed, it got worse and worse. Things like these are tied to the property. It's really, it's hard to get rid of. My best suggestion to Dustin was move when it was financially possible for him to do so, because it'll just stay with the property. The following night, things got even worse. It was well after midnight. I decided to go to bed early. My girlfriend's gonna stay up, and uh, she said she gets the weird feeling of someone standing over you being watched. She kind of glances over a little bit, and she says standing behind the curtains is a black mass that's standing there. And she looks down, and she sees dress shoes. That was about the last time she stayed the night. That manipulation of energy is all fear-based. And the more fear that that entity can create, the better it is the chancing of it surviving. It makes me wonder, you know, what is it doing at nighttime when I'm sleeping in bed? Is it standing there watching me? If you're scared, that's energy for them. They take that energy, and they feed off of it, and they grow on it, and they create more havoc. Two days later, I could hear the sound again of somebody walk through, but this time I'm able to, to see that direction. And I can hear someone walk through my house, walk through my living room, and walk into my bathroom, and it walks back out. And instead of hearing a normal close of a door, it's like someone slammed the door. <laughs> Previous occupants of Dustin Terry's home had opened a portal to the spirit world and invited evil into his apartment block. Now he had to deal with the terrifying consequences. I can hear people walk through my house, walk through my living room, and walk into my bathroom, and it walks back out. And instead of hearing a normal close of a door, it's like someone slammed the door. I was done. I was literally done. I got up. It must have been 12, 30, 1 o'clock. I grabbed my wallet, my cell phone, and I took off walking for the next five hours that night. Now I don't stay at home unless either my son comes over or my girlfriend comes over. I refuse to stay the night in my house alone. For now, Dustin Terry is stuck in his haunted apartment, but can't wait to move out. I spend a lot of my waking moments every day trying to find a different apartment, a different place. Whether spirits are invited into a property through people meddling with the occult or by simple accident, the results can be equally devastating and can affect the victims for years afterward. Story 9A, take one. I had just moved to Lansing. I transferred from, for work, I transferred from our Detroit office. Nathan was my boss, and uh, we just clicked very well. We started dating just a couple months after we met. A month later, I ended up pregnant. Surprise! He ended up very quickly moving out to Lansing with me. We 
get the house together, and I'm a stay-at-home mom, so it's important for me to find a house that I feel comfortable in. The house was, it was cute, small house. Four bedrooms, perfect for myself, Nathan, and, you know, Adam, who's one. He liked the house because he had the room to run around, and, you know, he had a pretty good-sized yard for him. Lillian is a practicing Wiccan, and she saged her new home to cleanse it of any negative energy. Being a Wiccan and being a witch, you have to protect yourself. You have to protect your family. She would go around the house with it kind of smoldering, and she would have a prayer that she would say. When someone cleanses their house with sage, they're going from room to room to sweeping out the rooms to removing the cobwebs of negative energy. That intention is very powerful, very strong. She knew I came from a Christian background. I was, I guess you would say, typical, closed-minded, you know, about those types of things. And it just always seemed real cheesy to me. Adam started seeing um, a little boy Got him up. You know, he started complaining about it, like, you know, he's just out there and he's watching me. I was playing with Adam and, and he had brought up the little boy being outside. I knew it wasn't a little boy because our neighbors didn't have little boy children, and our house was kind of far off of the road, so there was really no way. I knew it was a ghost. I knew, I, I right away. And I had asked him, you know, is he scary? Does he, you know, does he frighten you? Does he make you uncomfortable? And he said no, so I told him, I said, well, tell him to come in and play with you. And right away, he said, come on in and, and play. He shouldn't have done that. <laughs> it started creating some really bad problems. When a child invites someone that's their, their play children, you know, that's outside, they're playing in there, they're coming to the house, that spirit will manifest itself into a little boy, a little girl, a little friend. And sooner or later, this, that entity will start ostracizing against the mother and the father. We would play music for Adam when he was going to sleep, and it was always on really soft, and it was up on the dresser where he couldn't reach the, the iPod and the, the little radio it was connected to. We were just laying in bed. It was like 2 o'clock in the morning. We were watching TV, and uh, I heard music, and it was like really loud. We had a certain playlist for him, and it would jump off of the playlist into the song, into the artists, go down to a specific artist and play a certain song. It got to the point where it was almost a daily occurrence. I was afraid that it had something to do with, you know, in me inviting the, the ghost or whatever it was in, inside the house. And having been invited in, this entity was only going to get worse. When a negative spirit enters your house, it feeds off of the negativity, not just fear, but off negativity. So it makes people fight inside their homes. There was an incident where we were arguing. Wait! What about you? Okay, Your boy! Nathan Tegardine had inadvertently invited a ghost child into his family's home. His wife Lillian knew immediately that he had made a huge mistake. 
I started to feel really uneasy. Just about the, the atmosphere of the house had shifted. It went from being a comfortable home um, just to a real uneasy feeling all the time. When a negative spirit enters your house, it feeds off of the negativity, not just fear, but off negativity. So it makes people fight inside their homes. There was an incident where we were arguing. Wait! What about you? Hey, You're going to <sighs> It's just something that, again, you can't explain. There was nobody in that direction where the mirror even came from and neither of us owned that mirror. I had never even seen it before, and I had no clue where it came from. She didn't know where it came from. It wasn't anything good. When spirits support things, they take things from their timeline and they manifest it into this world. There is objects that they can manifest, like spoons from 1912, um, forks from shoes to different objects to let you know that they have the ability to move those objects. What do you do in a situation like that? The frightening events were putting an increasing strain on Lillian and Nathan's relationship. We were laying down watching TV and I felt a knock from underneath the bed. And at first, I, I thought it was my imagination because it was a pretty hard hit. At the very end of the bed, she looked down and saw... It had no eyebrows, and his eyes were just completely black, and it's just staring at me. I knew it wasn't good. I knew it wasn't something positive. I knew it was something that couldn't have the best intentions. Causing harm was, was something I was afraid of. I was afraid of that's where it was escalating to. It was getting to the point where it either could cause harm or was going to try to cause harm to somebody. Looking to escape their troubled home, the family decided to relocate. So we ended up moving into a house in Eaton Rapids with another addition to our family, our uh, second son, Caden. It was beautiful. My aunt actually owned it, and we were renting from her. And this was a house that Lily had talked about wanting to live in since we got together. Five bedroom, fenced in backyard, perfect for the kids. So I was really excited. I was pretty confident that that it hadn't followed us. Whatever, whatever it was, was staying, you know, staying put. Nathan could not have been more wrong. Having been invited to join their family, the evil that had been plaguing them started up again. Almost immediately after we moved in, I started to experience things. We wanted our younger son, you know, closest to us. His bedroom was right across from ours on the, on the upper level. I think he was crying pretty dramatically, and we went, we went up into the bedroom and his crib was pulled away from the wall. All the way next to the edge of the closet door. And it didn't matter where I put his crib in the room, it would be dragged towards the closet door. At that point, 
I would get a really negative feeling being in that room, and I wanted to get out of there. Fearing for the safety of their new baby, Lillian and Nathan decided enough was enough and moved house again. Within a week, I found a house. I put a down payment. We were, we were set to move. It really was hard to have to move out because I, I really did want that house. Since all of that happened, I'm not skeptical at all when it comes to paranormal experiences. When it comes down to it, Nathan's mental well-being is more important than my comfort. I was very happy to, to be away from such a, a negative feeling. Nathan has learned his lesson not to mess around with the spirit world, and so far, their new home has been paranormal free. I was 13. I was having some troubles in school, uh, some family issues. And uh, my parents decided that I should probably move to another place to maybe get a fresh start. And uh, that way I could work harder at school and pay more attention to things that were important to my future. Mark moved in with his aunt and her baby daughter, Megan. It was a move that would change his life forever. It's encompassed my whole life for a very long time, almost 23 years, in some way, shape, or form. And it's shown me that there are things out there that me or you or anybody um, cannot account for. These things are real. From the very beginning of his stay, Mark got a bad feeling about the house. It was a ranch-style home. Um, it was dated back to the late 1800s. It used to have a basement. One of the um, walls had actually been boarded up to what I believe was a root cellar. So, just my first impression moving into the home was that this is very old and this place is kind of weird the way it's situated on the street. 200 feet from the house next to it, which was a very large old home, uh, Victorian style. Mark's uneasiness increased further when strange things started to happen. It almost felt like the house had a mind of its own. And I had noticed a few things, like uh, the toilet would flush in the middle of the night. would be up. Lights would come on by themselves sometimes. Heavy wooden doors would open and close on their own. Um, at night, a few times, I'd heard my door rattle, uh, my doorknob rattle. its own personality. Young children, uh, adolescents, are very vulnerable to spirits because they're closer to the spirit world. They're not taught yet to dissociate and discern everything that comes to them. They take everything as it is and they see that. And because of that innocence, it's a lot easier for them to connect with that. 
kids have a lot of energy in general, but as some of the kids that have so much energy, they don't know what to do with it. That energy sometimes spews out and can create what we call the poltergeist anomaly. Mark was soon going to learn all about the destructive power of poltergeist energy. It was a Saturday evening. Just going out for a little bit. Which was not unusual. Well, you be good tonight, okay? And uh, I was left to babysit uh, Meg. And um, again, not an unusual thing. I was completely comfortable with it. I've been in the house alone plenty of times, at night and, and at, during the day. And um, never felt like, well, I never felt like I did that evening, uh, being watched like someone else was in the house. <laughs> Meg was uh, about 18 months, so just under two years. Um, she really hadn't gotten her legs underneath her yet. But this evening, I had heard a knock on her back door. In sports, the international basketball game. this particular officer that was working that night, a friend of the family. And he said that they had gotten a report or a phone call through dispatch that we were having a party um, in the house. Now, again, I'm the only one there um, with Meg, who was sound asleep in her crib. And he came in, he took a look around. Because I knew that the officer, he said, yeah, it came from next door the Victorian next to us. And I had never seen anyone come in or out of that house. We just always assumed that it was purchased, bought, and abandoned. I remember coming home every day from school and there were newspapers on the front porch that were always being delivered and the mailbox was overflowing with mail. And there's no way there could have been a phone call come from inside that house. There's just no way. And he said, well, I, I don't have any explanation for it. You know, just don't have anybody over here. You know, you're too young to be home alone with people in the house besides you and Meg. After the officer left, Meg started to cry. So obviously I went inside the room. I figured she had just dropped her bottle. I looked everywhere for this thing. kitchen and made her a bottle and when I came back in the room there was the bottle that I had been looking for sitting right in front of her crib on the floor where I would have been standing so that kind of rattled me a little bit because now I thought there's someone in this house. So now I was a, I was a bit scared. So um, I gave her the bottle. Fearing he was not home alone, Mark decided to grab some protection. behind the uh, couch where we kept a bat. It was kind of our last defense, our home security, so to speak. And I walked from one corner of the house to the, to the other.
13-year-old Mark Foster was home alone babysitting his infant cousin when he started to experience strange goings-on in his house. So when the knock came to the door, I hit the ceiling. They had received another report that we had a party going on in my house. Checked everything out again, made sure that I wasn't lying. And that's when I told him everything that was going on in the house. You're the only one in here. Honestly, he looked at me like, I know he's not lying to me. And um, he put his arm around my shoulder and he said, you know what, you just hold tight. He decided to go and find my aunt um, to let her know that she needed to come home. As soon as Mark was alone, the strange activity plaguing his cousin started again. But now, it was getting stronger. When I peeked in on her, she wasn't crying, um, but she was standing straight up in her bed. Like someone was holding her. <clears throat> um, up underneath the arms, um, because at that point, she couldn't stand with holding on to something. And then I thought I heard something behind me, and I turned to look. And maybe a second later, turned back around, and she was sound asleep, back laying down in her bed. Then the strange activity began to increase. The tea kettle went off, full blast. When I walked into the kitchen, every single electric burner on our stove was on. The cabinets were open. The teacups that she never used, fine china on their plates as if someone was coming for tea. Quite frankly, I almost my pants because I knew I needed to go into that room. I didn't have a choice, I had to turn the burners off. <laughs> Sorry to be so blunt, but I almost defecated on myself. That's how crazy it was. I made my way in there and uh, threw the tea kettle into the sink. Instinctively, Mark rushed back to protect his cousin, but whatever was in Mark's house had other ideas. Went to step through the doorway and I was physically picked up and thrown backwards through the door. Babysitting, 13-year-old Mark Foster was being tormented by paranormal activity. But then it escalated into a violent physical attack. And I was physically picked up and thrown backwards through the door. <clears throat> And uh, I still have the scar to prove it. Um, eight, eight to 12 stitches I had to have. It's 
spirits and ghosts are two different things, right? Spirits are someone that cross over, come back. Ghosts are someone that are here, stuck. Poltergeist anomaly are built of energy, built of energy of fear, fear-based. And now that fear-based, it grows from that. It grows from energy from children. And from that, it can be actually manipulated into actually be a physical form and actually act out to harm somebody. It's the fear that really creates the, the anomaly of that poltergeist that's there. Stunned and bleeding, Mark was afraid that his cousin had been attacked too. I knew I was dealing with something evil. The only way to describe it, I was damn well determined to get in that room. That was my only thought. I need to get in and protect the baby, that's it. Nothing was gonna keep me out of that room. I just put my shoulder down and I ran as hard as I could. I grabbed her out of her crib, um, walked back through the doorway into the living room and um, sat down on the couch and just waited and um, I was still bleeding. My aunt came home and saw the condition I was in and you know instantly panicked and was like, what is going on? I told her everything that happened. Definitely, I could tell she was 100% believe in me. Well, it's sort of like whatever it was that I told you, I got you. That's the way I felt afterwards. I got you. Now you know. Now you know that I'm here and we got you. A spirit or a ghost may want to try to kill someone just because they still either hold a grudge towards that person that they knew in life, or because they're just a very violent, negative, possibly even demonic type spirit. Still terrified by his experience that night, Mark moved out of his aunt's house shortly after. I became very introverted after I came back to Chicago. Um, mostly because I had lost a connection um, with not just my family, but I think a little bit of myself. Um, I was still kind of dealing with the results of my attack. Um, so I didn't really talk to anybody. The reason through my experience why people are so hesitant to talk about paranormal experiences or encounters is fear. That's it, fear. Their fear of being ridiculed by people or fear of somebody not believing them or fear of not knowing what to do. We're losing our connection with trying to communicate with who's really there and we're getting caught up in all this fear base and losing the sense of communicating and understanding what we're all about here in the physical and the spirit. Years later, Mark would get a clue about the reason behind the attacks. I'm 100% convinced that my encounter was a direct result of what they found in, on that property. They um, dug up the foundation of the old house. They uncovered a tunnel that led from the Victorian next door to the house that we lived in. And when they knocked down some of the brick, they found the human skeletal remains of what appeared to be a family.
but I believe personally that it, it was um, the angry spirit of, if not that whole family, at least the father figure that they uncovered that was trying to tell me, this is my house. This is my family. I don't want you here. You're gonna get out one way or the other. I wouldn't want anything that ever happened to me to happen to anyone, even my worst enemy. Not in a million years. It was definitely the scariest night of my life. Being tormented by spirits for one night is bad enough. But for some children, the terror goes on and on. Michaela. Don McDonald and his children, Michaela and Cameron, moved into a farmhouse with a disturbing past. But the cheap rent proved too good a deal to turn down. We knew the stories of the farm, that a young girl, about 17, had been murdered there and left in the barn to rot for two years before her body was found. What started the search was after um, the owner of the time had gotten in a fight with his roommate or a tenant, and, um, well, the one guy ended up dying, and then the police were called. I think there was more to the murders than what they said. There's the possibility of bodies still existing on the property what we were told. When 16-year-old Michaela arrived, she felt a darkness coming from the barn. The landlord had told us that the previous owners had moved out really quick, didn't even give um, a notification that they were leaving, and left everything there. He left real quick without him even knowing, so he wasn't sure what happened. Everything in the house was left um, from the food on the tables to um, all the furniture, clothes, and such. Creepy. Very creepy. Kind of like a chill going up your spine kind of thing. Like you're being watched. My daughter Michaela didn't like it. She didn't like the feeling of the place. It was just, she knew we couldn't really afford too much, so. Children can tend to attract paranormal activity because, because they are more open to spirit and it's easy for spirit to interact with them. A spirit may sometimes target a child uh, because that child is much more easier to terrorize or scare out of a display of power, and that child is unable to defend themselves.
the family settled into their new home as best they could. The oppressive atmosphere bothered them, but nothing untoward happened at first. I believe it was a few months after we were there, you'd hear these really loud um, bangs. Police have a suspect in custody, but... Shortly after, 16-year-old Michaela McDonald Smith and her family moved into a farmhouse with a murderous past. She started hearing strange noises in the night. I believe it was a few months after we were there, you'd hear these really loud um, bangs. Police have a suspect in custody, but... There was times where you could just tell it was footsteps running on the stairs back and forth. You hear footsteps, like the sound of someone with work boots on walking up the stairs and to the hallway. We would run up there, you know, like, is there an intruder or is my little brother out of bed, perhaps? But it was, there was never anyone there. Some of the early signs of a haunting can be things like lights flickering, uh, doors opening or closing. Um, Different things like that could happen because that's what a spirit has the energy to be able to do. the point where there was doors and windows shutting by themselves. We always had problems with the lights, always turning on and off. Turned on the light and the light just turned off on you. And it's like, okay. At a location where there's been a violent death, particularly a murder, there is a much greater chance that a haunting will result because when a spirit passes in that traumatic way, there's usually a lot of anger there and that pent up anger will result in them being locked to that location. Sometimes, because I work late at night, the doors would start slamming and you didn't know which doors were there because either the doors were closed or it was the sound of a, like a wood stove door closing really hard. Pretty weird. was in bed and I had just gone to bed. It was about 1.30 in the morning 
and I just had that feeling to look over in the corner of my room. stood this man and he had like a he was black of the night he had a top hat on and it seemed to be like a trench coat type so back like in the olden days they used to wear their long coats and to this day we call him the man in black It stood there for a few minutes, and I was too scared to move. And then it just took off uh, outside of my door. Really scared me and had me starting to believe that this place was really, really haunted. Hauntings can start out with something as innocent as footsteps, and they can progress very rapidly into much more threatening activity. Perhaps it's because the spirit is feeling you out. What level of fear are you going to have? What reaction are you going to have? And the more they can intimidate you, the more they will escalate their activity. Michaela was frightened by the activity in the house. But it was the nearby barn where a young woman's murdered body had once been found that really filled her with dread. From the barn, you would feel a lot of staring. Um, it would make you feel uncomfortable. You were always constantly being watched. Whenever you were near windows, especially in the kitchen, which was a great view to the barn. You would see fragments of shadows. Since moving into their new farmhouse, Michaela McDonald Smith and her family had been experiencing paranormal activity. Then one night while standing in her kitchen, Michaela had the strange feeling she was being watched from the barn. like this uh it seemed to be like a shadow man and he would walk across one of the beams in the barn and you just walk back repeatedly <laughs> the one that was in the barn was always negative he he seemed always angry Hell 
help would come from an unlikely source. When he was threatening her, the spirit she called the man in black would show up and step in front of her and kind of protect her from him. Yeah, he scared me, but at the same time, I felt safe um, from the other spirits from him. So it was almost like the property had its own, like, black angel. But the man in black couldn't protect Michaela and Don from what was yet to come. When I turned 17, my dad had thrown a birthday party for me, and I had brought a bunch of my friends from my new school. We had the fire, roasted some marshmallows, and we're all hanging outside, and um, everyone had started to have a bad headache. My dad started to get a really bad, violent look in his eye. Um, his head was just driving him nuts. And then I, all you heard was the screaming outside and we thought someone was in the forest. No one knew what to do. We didn't know if it was a real person. So my dad went out to the forest, and uh, this was the first time anyone's gone to the forest at night. We got close to the forest and we never went in it, but we were walking by it, but we got this strange feeling like, like we've never felt before. And it was like, we shouldn't be there. And we just had to stop and we just, looked at each other like, okay, do you feel that? All of a sudden we see this massive figure come like sticking out of the forest. At her 17th birthday party, Michaela McDonald Smith and her friends were startled when they heard strange sounds coming from a nearby forest. Her father, Don, left the group to investigate the source of the screaming. All of a sudden, we see this massive figure come, like, sticking out of the forest, and it just scared, the, scared us completely. And we're just like, yeah, okay, we're done, we're running. I remember just seeing their flashlights and they came running back. Like, I mean, they came running back. And I don't think I've ever seen my dad so scared. If you're witnessing a very large dark cloud, chances are that is multiple entities and probably multiple negative entities gathering together. That, yeah, that thing in the forest was probably the number one most scariest thing I've ever had to deal with so far. I would say this thing was like, it was taller than us, it was bigger, it was, 
I couldn't even describe what the, like, kind of a shape it was. The advice I would give somebody who's experiencing violent activity from a spirit would be to contact a local paranormal team to try to get assistance. Shaken by his experience, Don called in a team of paranormal investigators. The psychic and the lead investigator, Michaela, went to the barn. First time we went in, we were getting spikes on our K2 meters. And at one point, um, a team member, Brad, a medium psychic, he picked up on a male spirit who I believe he said was the male who was murdered at the farm. And then as we were moving around, he picked up on another spirit, female spirit. Uh, the first recording that we caught was a male voice. It sounded agitated. The first time we heard it, it was basically just a high. Like, what well, did you all hear that? We're all like, we all heard that. When we all walked in there, no one wanted to be in there. It was hard to breathe. My teeth were, like, clenched automatically. They hurt. I was shaking, uh, not from fear, but more from anger. And Michaela, she couldn't, she couldn't breathe. Like, she was shaking. And I guess her gums started to bleed. I had to walk out of the barn. And Brad decided that this oppressive feeling was getting to be too much, and he started asking more direct questions to if there was anything there. And he was trying to basically get a response back. And at one point, he started choking. He felt he was being choked out. And actually had to leave that location because um, he was basically getting in distress. And when I was in the barn by myself, I had what sounded like footsteps circling me in the stone. It's a stone floor. So there was something of a heavy weight walking around my, walking around me and making the noise. I had stones thrown at me from inside. A lot of just negative feelings from the place. I just pretty much didn't like the feeling in there and left. If a spirit doesn't like you or it is particularly negative, in rare cases, it can throw objects at you. And obviously, that is an expression of its anger and its intent to hurt you. And that takes an awful lot of energy, usually a lot of negative energy, to propel something through the air like that. I have a photo of Brad walking toward me, and there is a, what looks like a black mass in the corner, it's blocking any light behind it, it's actually, looks like a human-sized shadow. When we brought the evidence back, I think for them, it was more of a reassurance. They felt justified, vindicated, like, yes, you guys got something, so it's, it's real.
when things were starting to get more spookier, I didn't know if, you know, was this safe for us to be here? Were we causing something more than what we should be just by being here and living here? Was it safe for my brother or my dad or me or anyone else that came to the house? So in 2014, we decided to move. I think there was a lot that happened in that barn um, that a lot of people will not know or will ever know. Story number 23. house that we lived in, there was a lot of paranormal activity. My family had experiences in that house. I can't speak for them, but I think just because I was sensitive, I picked up on more of it. What I felt about the basement growing up was always fear. At one point in time, my family had it refinished, and they considered it a playroom, but I never liked it. I was never comfortable there. When they moved me down there, I was about 15. And I would hear voices in the back room. There was a very, very dark and dusty back room. And no one was there. I would hear voices coming from the vents. I remember thinking, is there a party going on or something like that? Other times it was like wailing, like sounds of like someone was in pain or crying. I couldn't tell you if the voices were male or female, and I never could distinguish the words that they were saying. This would be just the beginning of Christine's torment. My grandmother, who I love dearly, she went into a rest home and she had had a painting of Jesus. I took that because it always reminded me of her. So when I put it in my room, within two weeks, the painting started to ooze this stuff. It was like a brown, red, orange liquid. from the frame, it was coming from the actual painting. I don't think anybody, religious or not, wants to see a picture of Jesus leak brown stuff in their house. We took the painting and we put it in the garbage. have the ability to make us see anything that they want us to see. By making a painting bleed, the spirit is trying to shake the foundation of the individual's faith. From that point on, the activity in Christine's basement began to intensify. I would leave the lights on and they would always be off when I came in. So I would have to walk in from the garage with the lights out. And 
on my left side, I would feel like something was being thrown at me. I don't know what it was. I didn't see anything. I learned to remember the Psalm 23. recite that. That's how scary it was to me. Refreshes my soul. Reciting quotes from the Bible empowers the individual. It enforces their faith, and it makes them feel like they are in control. But bear in mind, it could, in fact, anger the entity in question. When I would turn on the light, there would be little scratches, little marks. Soon, Christine began to see the physical manifestations of what had plagued her. One time I woke up um, and the clock started to run backwards. But then when I looked up, there was three dark figures. It made me feel scared and it made me feel very alone. The nightly torment continued until Christine was old enough to leave home. I stayed there until I was 19 when I got a job, and I moved out. I moved in with some friends. Christine thought she had finally escaped the terror of whatever was in the basement. up to um, shadow people slamming their hands on my back. <laughs> Woke up, came out into the living room and looked on the wall and there was like feces had been smeared all over the wall. Convinced evil spirits were attached to her, Christine turned to her religion for help. Some of the girls that I worked with asked me to go with them to some healing services and some prayer services. And I said, what the heck? When I went up to go get a blessing, that's when, when things started to really manifest. That's when it was kind of hard to say, no, there's nothing attached to me. It was kind of clear. The closer that I got to him, the more scared that I got. But also, I would became enraged. And I remember standing there thinking, why would I be angry? Why would I have this rage? The temperature changed from hot to very, very hot to very, very cold, and then back again. And when my eyes met the priest, it, it just, he rec there was recognition in his eyes. After years of torment by evil entities, 
Christine Corda sought solace at her local church. But the entities that had attached themselves to her had other ideas. And I remember going up in the air. I remember looking up and seeing the ceiling going by like I was being wheeled in a gurney, but only I was literally in midair. Landed on the floor in the back of the church. The priest came over and he started to pray, and that's when I sort of was coming in and out. Remember, there was a lot of pain. And I remember that they were putting hot, burning water in my face. I came later to learn that it was holy water. Whatever entity was there, whatever spirit, it was trying to take over me. That's what I felt. I felt my will going up against their that will. I didn't know if I was gonna live, I didn't know if something was gonna, you know, overtake me in my sleep and try to kill me or actually kill me. So that was the scariest time, the recognition that, that it was real. Levitation can definitely be associated with demonic spirits. If a body or an individual levitates under a demonic attack, that person could very potentially be possessed to the point where you would need exorcism. It, it was traumatic, to say the least. Father had told me that he felt that I needed a formal exorcism. An exorcism expels the demon from either the host, area, or object that it is in possession of. Demonic are believed to be disembodied, malevolent beings. They're said to be fallen angels, but they are very aggressive and they are there to hurt you. The priest quickly arranged for an exorcism to be performed on Christine. At her side was her spiritual mentor and friend, Frank Martino. With Christine, uh, with the exorcism that she had with the priest, I uh, was there as a supportive position, just supporting uh, Christine. And at some point then, she began to go into a, a tremor. He did some prayers. He did some prayers in Latin. voice speaking to us. We heard a, a, a tongue coming out of her, which was obviously a demonic. It took, it was literally like nine hours. I do not remember much at all. The exorcism is a form of, of attacking and challenging a demonic being. He said that he recognized it as a demon or a demonic being. He didn't know who or what, um, and he just prayed that I would be released from whatever was oppressing me, as he put it. At that point, there will be deliverance. When I left that night, I felt better than I had in years. I was only 21 and I felt free. I felt light. Um, I wasn't depressed. I wasn't oppressed. It just was, he, whatever he did had done something to me that nothing had ever done. And I felt like I was glad to be alive, to be honest. 
I'm alive and I survived, and it's wonderful. And I feel that I have been victorious. That's possible for everyone. No matter how dark it is, the light is always at the end of the tunnel. Some spirits try to possess the living for their own evil ends. Other spirits want to take over the space where they once lived. Carrie-Anne's Haunted Boutique, store number 26. Ever since I was a child, I wanted to open up my own boutique, like a one-stop shop for women. So I decided better time than never to take the plunge and open up my own business. Carrie Ann found what she thought was the perfect location for her boutique in an historic old building. I love old, I love antiques, I love the history of the building, dated from the 1800s. Upon purchasing it, I had learned that the home initially belonged to a general, General William Kirby, who served in the Civil War and Spanish-American War, and that he would bring slaves hair and hide them for safety. Just after the boutique opened, strange things started to happen. I would go to close up at night, and I would go upstairs, shut off the lights, come downstairs. Ann Sauron had just opened her dream business in a historic property, but there was more to the building than first met the eye. I would go to close up at night, and I would go upstairs, shut off the lights, come downstairs. And then I would see lights that would be back on when I know that I had just shut them off. First, I thought I was just overtired. My mind is playing tricks on me. Then I would go upstairs, shut them off, come back down, the lights would be on again. and he basically laughed and said that it was impossible for that to happen. Nothing wrong. Paranormal activity can sometimes begin with small things like doors opening and lights flickering. A spirit is trying to initially get someone's attention. These are things they can manipulate because they are made of energy and they can interact with those electronic devices easier. And then it can escalate into something more than that. the weird activity started to increase. You would hear footsteps. You would hear loud banging, whether it be pipes or loud banging on the walls. You would hear crying, you would hear some screams. It wasn't just unexplained noises. The water 
burners would be turned on hot, and in each sink, steaming hot water would be coming up. I was very frightened and very scared of what's going on here. Soon, manifestations started to appear. It was one Saturday. We were getting ready to close, and it was myself and one of the hairdressers. She had seen a woman coming through the front door, go walking down the hall, and she said, I'll be with you in a minute. Roger? She called out to her son and said, tell her I'll be with her in a minute. And he's like, what are you talking about, Mom? Like, there's nobody here. And she's like, yes, there is. She was very, very, very firm that there was somebody in the building. It was a person that went walking by, but there wasn't anybody that was there. It would take one more incident for Carrie Ann to admit the truth. Her boutique was haunted. Right outside of the salon, we heard a woman crying very loud as if she were right in the salon with us. And my friend, who is a non-believer, looked at me and said, you, you're playing a game with me. Right around the wall, there was knocking that seemed like it just went knock, 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 knock all the way around, very, very loud. Needless to say, that person jumped up and ran out the back door and said, I will never not believe you again. That was just that, OK, I'm, I have a haunted boutique. It wasn't long before the paranormal activity started to target Carrie Ann's son. I was sitting by the cash register, and I heard my son saying, yes, yes what? what? OK. okay. And I saw him walk out of the boutique and down the hall toward the stairs. Yes, what? OK. And I asked him what he was doing. And he said, someone is calling his name and telling him to come upstairs. And I said, who? He said, children telling him to come up. The harassment became more threatening. When my son was at the boutique, he was locked in the bathroom and he could not get out. things were happening in Carrie Ann's boutique, and now they were threatening her son, Carter. He was locked in the bathroom, and he could not get out. Carter! I go, unlock it the way that you locked it. Carter! Open the door, honey! And then he started calling out and said that he could not get out. I go, unlock it the way that you locked it. And he said, I can't reach it. And even on his tippy toes, or even jumping, he was probably this far away from locking the door. The entity wasn't done with Carter yet, and things were about to get worse. As he walked by around the whole perimeter of the boutique,
drawers were opening, clothing was falling off the walls. There was pictures that were shaking. This went around the whole perimeter, and my son looks at me with his big eyes. That's the ghost, isn't it, Mommy? Like that, my mom m protection mode came in and ran downstairs. That was the most frightening experience. Terrified and afraid for her son's safety, Carrie Ann called in paranormal investigators. When I first met Carrie, she was nervous. Um, she definitely had some, some stuff going on. She was concerned. She really wanted some answers. When we first set up, we bring IR cameras. We then go through with audio recorders to capture voices. There was one part of the basement way in the back that I just had a bad feeling. Didn't want to go back into that area. You definitely just get that gut feeling like, okay, there's something, something not quite right down here. This is definitely a, an active, a very highly active location. The ghost hunter suggested that there may have been a fire here in the home by the looks of one of the walls. And then shortly after, the little boy says, fireman. When we heard the fireman's response, it was kind of like one of those no way moments. You don't, uh, you don't always get stuff like that. The investigators decided to see if they could contact the former owner of the property, General Kirby, for answers. We were basically just trying to get General Kirby to come out. Our psychic opened herself up and allowed him to use her energy to, to come forward. Two seconds later, there was a giant, I mean, giant bang. I mean, the whole house shook. It all hell broke loose. The mirrors in the boutique were rattling. The pipes started banging. I've never experienced that level of noise before. Bang, 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 bang. bang, bang. It sounded like a machine gun going off. Then the activity started to focus on Carrie Ann. We started to feel sick. I was vomiting. I had gotten so sick, I couldn't even move, and I was on the floor. You were hearing footsteps like something was walking around the boutique. I had heard footsteps standing above me. I was so scared I couldn't even move. I felt like I was paralyzed. I thought somebody broke in here and they're going to hurt me, torture me, rape me, kill me. Stop it! And as soon as I yelled, hey, stop, it just stopped. It just seemed just to go away. Making a demand of a spirit to stop certain activity can sometimes work because you're showing that you're in charge of the situation and the location rather than them. Despite her experiences, Carrie Ann decided to try to live alongside the spirit of General Kirby. In some cases, it is possible for an individual to live in harmony with spirits because those spirits aren't malevolent or evil and they're just human spirits as we ourselves will be someday. I moved in with them. I moved in with, with the spirits that are in here. They have accepted me being in here, and I have learned that, okay, this if I'm gonna be here in this building, then this is, this is what I have. The talk of cleansing for Carrie's place came up one time, and she was pretty much okay with what was going on here. It adds a character to the building, I guess you could call it. Mostly we feel the spirits here just wanna be left alone.
Sometimes a spirit is so territorial that it will try to physically prevent the living from entering the space it believes is theirs. Paranormal Survivor 2, Kate's Haunted Nova Scotia Home, take one. I was actually living in the States at the time when my ex-husband, now ex-husband, moved up here and bought this house. We'd seen it online. So he bought it before I actually saw it. I was amazed at the openness of it. It felt like it should be such a happy home. And of course, there's no neighbors nearby, so we had peace, we had privacy, everything we could want to raise a family. I'd been here less than a month. My children were in bed, it's about 10 o'clock at night. My husband's out working and I was in the living room. And the noise was unbearable. It was a static radio, it was very, very loud and somebody was trying to speak. I couldn't make sense of what they were trying to say because of the static in the background. It must have lasted about five minutes. Um, I mentioned it to my husband when he came home from work, he brushed it off. That wasn't the last unexplained noise Kate would hear in the house. We heard footsteps, constantly. We'd actually hear the basement door unlatch. And the footsteps going through the hallway and upstairs. My husband, who's a huge skeptic, didn't believe me. There was always an explanation, oh, it's the wind, it's an old house, something's happening. And one day he heard the footsteps. And he said, okay, I'll believe you if the basement door, if I hear it unlatch. Patrick's dream Nova Scotia home was turning into a nightmare. Even her skeptical husband was forced to admit something was wrong. One day he heard the footsteps. And he said, okay, I'll believe you if the basement door, if I hear it unlatch. And he heard it unlatch and clear as day, we heard the footsteps going through the house upstairs. There was a lot of instances of those kind of noises. The activity inside the house began to get more menacing. I hated being alone when I first moved here. You knew you were being watched. You could feel it, that somebody else was following you. You can feel somebody close to your face, monitoring you, feeling and watching every move that you make. It's scary, 
That's what bed covers are for. You pull them over the top and you ask it to go away. Terrified, Kate asked her mother to visit so she wouldn't be alone in the house. But that just made matters worse. My mother came over from Scotland just about a year after I moved here. But anyway, one morning she came downstairs and said she'd had the most god-awful sleep. She felt all night as though there was a heavy weight in her. Almost like somebody was holding her down and forcing her down. At one point, she described what she thought almost felt like rape. I thought, Mom, come on. You know, nobody's in your room with you. Anyway, she's like, look at my legs. And she showed me these handprints on her legs and big bruises massive handprint roses on her legs. And I thought, well, maybe she did that herself. But then I thought, why? It was a bizarre occurrence and no explanation. She was petrified. I have worked many cases where people have been allegedly attacked by spirits. I believe personally that spirits can sexually assault you and leave evidence of that attack. I have seen scratches. I have seen what looks like burn marks. I have seen bruises. And sitting down interviewing those individuals was heartbreaking. The malevolent force that attacked her mother soon turned its attention towards Kate. This was the first time I was ever truly scared of the house. Um, I was outside mowing. Ah! Ah! And I looked up and I saw somebody staring out the window at me. I thought, my God, there's somebody in my house. So I stopped mowing and I ran to the door. It was like running into a brick wall. I forced myself to come in, and the feeling was like something I will hopefully never feel again. It was so cold. It was like walking through the thickest molasses you could possibly imagine. And all I wanted to do was get my phone. And I grabbed my phone and I ran out. And I could breathe again, the pressure was off. It was, it was unbelievable. I mean, I called a friend of mine. She said she'd be right up. And by the time I got here, Kate was visibly upset. And she said that she had come outside and there was someone in the window uh, who waved to her. And I had heard that story before when the house was empty about people driving by and they'd looked at the house and someone had been in the window. I said to Kate, we have to be strong. We have to go in there and, you know, be a presence ourselves. And we just came in. But she came with me and we walked in the door and she froze. Every hair in her arm and top, she had goosebumps. It was scary, the two of us. It was fighting trying to walk through the house. The feeling in here, we were being watched, we were being pushed out. It was, it was like nothing I can even describe. Get out of this house! This is not your home! And um, went from room to room, trying to be as strong as possible and just saying, this is not your home. This is Kate's home, you must leave. She led the way, screaming, screaming throughout the house. Get out of this house! This is not your home! Get out! 
After we had gone through all the house, we went back downstairs. We could just feel this rush of cold air coming very quickly. Screaming, get out, get out, get out. After attacking her mother, something evil was trying to take over Kate Kirkpatrick's home. We could just feel this rush of cold air coming very quickly right along the hall and just stopped right here between the two of us. And her eyes went huge and mine were huge. And she said, do you feel that? And I said, yes. So we just said again, you cannot be here. You are not welcome. You cannot be here. and all of a sudden you could feel it just sort of move away again. But, you know, your hair was all standing up and goosebumps and everything. I'm thinking I've completely lost my marbles. But it was happening to me and it was very real. And it was perhaps one of the scariest things I've ever had to go through. Kate decided to look into the house's past. I think I started looking into it a bit more. I began with just trying to find out the history of the house. And this house is well known in the community for its ghosts and its horror stories. Going back generations, I mean, we're talking over 100 years. What she discovered was shocking. And it blew my mind, but it made sense that this was at one point a body house. A lot of abuse went on here towards women. Empowered with her new knowledge, Kate contacted a friend to investigate the home. Kate was a little concerned, being new to the community, that she would be viewed as a bit odd or eccentric if she was to tell other people what was happening in her home. It was actually common knowledge here that her house was haunted. I actually felt relieved. I remember speaking to them and thinking, OK, you don't think I'm crazy. Kimberly and her team set about trying to find the spirit plaguing the house. I didn't have any feelings about the home when I initially came here until we entered the room where the most activity happened that evening. In that room, it was a very dense feeling. The air almost felt like a humid day without the heat. One of the EVPs that we captured actually happened within the first five minutes of being in the room. I was standing in the corner of the room, and I kept getting pushed forward. I felt like I was being pushed. I had a hard time getting my words out. And at the time, I could see my team members looking over at me because they were concerned because I was not able to, to talk. And we got an EVP that says, tell Kim I'm moving her body. Tell Kim I'm moving her body. Spirits can be extremely territorial, especially if you're dealing with spirits from another time. If the spirit man in question was accustomed to being able to go into the brothel and have his way with the females, there's nothing saying that he's not going to do that in this time or place. Not wanting to risk any further attacks, Kimberly organized a spirit circle to try to remove the spirit. At the end of the evening, we do a spirit circle to try to convince the spirit, talk to them, tell them they can leave, explain that they don't have to be here. That night, um, I had an experience, which I can only explain as a psychic experience, because I actually saw I saw him in my head. I could see him and the women that he he was keeping here. I saw them in my head. I asked him to leave. I wanted him to cross over to the other side. 
and I wanted him to let me know that he was gone when he was gone. I needed a sign. I wanted him to make a noise. The spirit proved too powerful to be crossed over. Kimberly was able to calm the activity, but Kate took it upon herself to cleanse her home. I think the more I heard about this house and what it was, it angers you. I'm a woman, I'm living here. I'm obviously being affected. But a friend of mine had said, I'm the one to change it. You know, stay there, fight it, fight it. And I have. i am stayed in this house longer than anybody else in the last 200 years. I'm still here. It's all about creating a happy atmosphere here, which is what I did for years. This is what's going to change the house. It's going to make me happier here. And it's hopefully going to change the house. Survivor 2, Adina's Midnight Stalker, story number 28, take one. I moved to the area because it was a really nice, old area with lots of townhouses, and it was a really big, beautiful townhouse. I loved it right from the beginning. My mom was right down the street too, so that helped. Dina had barely moved in when she started to have strange experiences in her new home. I wasn't able to turn any lights on at night. I'd go to the bathroom, flick the switch, and nothing would go on, and I'd think to myself, I gotta change the light bulb in the morning. The next morning it would work, the light would go on. Same thing with living room lights, uh, kitchen lights. You'd always feel like there was something watching you all the time. Everybody felt it. Anybody that came in, I would catch them staring at the stairs and ask them why they were doing that. One night, I went to the kitchen. I was half asleep. I was just going to get a drink. Ah! I tried to turn on the light, and when I did, this big, bright light shot out of the bulb. Ah! 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 I seen all these silhouettes in my kitchen, all these people in my kitchen. I ran into my bed and I just put the covers over myself and I was up all night until the sun came up. I didn't sleep. Dina's fear was nothing compared to the terror she was about to feel. I awoke to something pushing my shoulders back and I couldn't move, I couldn't move my upper body. It was pinned down. And when I opened my eyes, Um, there's a guy on top of me. It wasn't a guy, it was a spirit, it was a ghost. I couldn't move, I couldn't... I couldn't think I was 
I was trapped, mentally and physically trapped by this thing. He was pure evil. He was evil. I can't even say what he said to me on camera. It's so vulgar and disgusting. I'll never forget it, I'll tell you that. I'll never forget his voice, ever, as long as I live. I'll never forget it. Seeking help, Dina told her mother about the attack. She didn't really think it was real, or she didn't think I was, she maybe thought I was embellishing, or she thought, I'd always try and think of something logical. You know, you were dreaming or anything else, anything but that. Dina was terrified and tried to get rid of the spirit herself. I found this prayer book and I started to bless the house on my own. And I had a good feeling like it was gonna be okay. I thought that it would take anything evil or anything with any bad intent out. And that was a mistake. It just, it got worse. Attempting to cleanse a property by yourself, uh, not knowing really what you're doing, can lead to activity becoming worse, the haunting becoming worse. Uh, and the reason for that is because you don't know what you're doing and you don't know how to go about it. Uh, so it, it can backfire on you. Dina's attempt to cleanse her home didn't work. I was in bed again in my, my bedroom and um, I was just sleeping, and then I felt something crawling up my body. I couldn't move. I was trying to move. I was trying to get up. And something was just, you, like, you can feel the pressure. It's like, how is something doing this? I could hear the grunts, like his raspy, the raspy breathing, very heavy, raspy breathing. He said, die, bitch. Bitch. Horror. Horrific. Soon, the spirit began to torment Dina in other ways. I was checking my voicemails on my cell phone, and I got a voicemail. To listen to your messages, press 1. I am watching you. It was him. He was on my voicemail. Tondo was being attacked in her bed by an evil spirit. But just when she thought it couldn't get any worse, it began to torment her in other ways. I am watching you. How did he get there? How did he do that? You know, I didn't know what to think. I was a voice saying, I see you, I, I can see you. I'm, I see you in the shower. Every private thing of my life is someone watching. I always had eyes on me, and he let me know that. I called the police. I let the police listen to the message, hoping that they would be able to find a logical explanation. 
the officer was very helpful. They did try and look and find out if there was a phone number, but nobody, there was no phone number. There was nothing, nothing for that time. No record, nothing. There was nothing for that phone call. Hoping to escape the evil spirit, Dina decided to move into a new house along with her mother. I thought that was a great idea. We could help each other with the rent and economically it would be uh, good for both of us. I felt like if she's around, nothing's, you know, nothing's gonna happen, you know? I guess you get that way with your mother. Feel safe. Sleeping alongside her mother, Dina finally felt safe. My mother and I uh, were sharing a bed that night. The air conditioner was only in one room. It was a really hot night. And it was about 3 a.m. I said to Dina, what's that? And uh, she didn't know. So I went into the bathroom to check it out. Things just started to fall off the shelves in the bathtub. All the bottles started to fall one by one into the tub. And then she ran back into the bed. And then they started falling off the counter into the sink. And it's going and going and going. It's just not stopping. I said, do you believe me now? Do you believe me now? Please, believe me. I just wanted somebody to believe. And she, she did, yeah. She's seeing it with her own eyes. We were just, we were petrified. That's all, we were petrified. Dina called paranormal investigator John Moore and psychic medium Craig Lee Floor. We went in the home right away, I felt a very aggressive and oppressive spirit. It felt like something was sitting on your chest. It wasn't nice. It, it, it was obvious that there was definitely something going on. I looked for the hot spots of what I think will be the hot spots. Um, one was she had a mirror in the hallway, which was kind of, I would say maybe used as a portal. definitely felt uncomfortable going into her room. He didn't have to tell you he didn't want you there. You knew he didn't want you there. They said there was um, definitely an evil entity in the house. The, the entity was definitely demonic in nature. There was no question that that was what he was. That freaked me out. I I knew he was evil, but I didn't know he was demonic. That's, that's a whole other kind of scared. Because he was a demon and they had to get somebody in that knew how to deal with demonic entities. seen the man since John and Craig cleansed my house. I hope I never see him again. But I, I'm still weary. I don't know. I don't know if he's really gone.
can be very difficult to totally ever get rid of uh, an evil or negative spirit just because they are so powerful. You can try crossing them over, you can try using an exorcism to get rid of them, but it may not always work. He's such a strong force. stuck with me for so long. I'm scared. I'm still scared. Sometimes evil spirits seem to enjoy terrorizing their living victims face to face over a long period of time. On other occasions, the living see the face of evil for just a fleeting moment but that doesn't make it any less terrifying. Paranormal Survivor 2, story number eight, take one. In 2005, we found this house and bought it then. It had been empty for about two years. Nice big white house. Uh, it was a nice, comfortable house. It was what we needed. Backed onto a church. Nice background. It was good. What Wayne and Darcy didn't know was that this average house hit some less than average occupants. Once we bought the house, things started to happen. bent over the couch, um, turning on the light, I believe. And I got tapped on the shoulder three times. Did you just tap me on the shoulder? No. I'm doing dishes. What's up? And I heard him say something to the effect of, what would you like? Like, what do you want? I put my head in the living room, and I could see him turn around, and the color go from his face. She was nowhere near me when I turned around and, and it kind of scared me. That was just the beginning of the strange activity in the house. There would be times that I would be in bed and it sounded like somebody was washing the dishes in the kitchen um, by hand and stacking them in a dish drainer um, and walking throughout the kitchen. things that started to happen in Wayne and Darcy's new home. Doors were opening and closing, including the pantry door, which is just off the kitchen. I came downstairs. I didn't know if somebody was in the house. just 
came quietly down the stairs as much as I could and lurked about, but there was nothing, nothing there. Soon the activity started to become more frequent and increase in intensity. watching TV and just out of nowhere it sounds like the china cabinet falls over smashing everything it's loud you feel the vibration it's 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 pretty scary we jumped out of the chairs went in the dining room and the china cabinet still standing there And we just looked at each other and looked in the dining room and we were, we were scared. We didn't know what to think. And then again, but it came from upstairs, from the bedroom that we believed was right above the living room. But it was the same type of noise that we heard in the dining room. It just sounded like the china cabinet had fallen over. But of course, we don't have a china cabinet upstairs. It's, it's just a scary, scary thing to happen. That's when we started to believe that, it, that there was something in the house. Before this, nothing's really ever happened in my life that made me think about other people being here or entities or whatever. Someone hears a very loud sound, like the sound of breaking glass or even pots and pans falling. It can be an indication that a portal, a spirit portal, has opened. Wayne and Darcy tried to live with the strange noises, but worse was yet to come. We've seen different shadow figures, especially in the dining room. The dining room has seemed to have the most activity in the house. They're usually very quick. Like it's like a, a flash of something going across the dining room. It's a bit nerving, you know, it, it gets you. It makes your blood go, wondering what's going on. Soon the manifestations plaguing Wayne and Darcy's house would become much more disturbing. I came down, I turned on the light, and there was a head floating right in right in the middle of my view. And it was an old man. It was not solid. It was like an apparition. He was looking directly at me. We, if you can call it, made eye contact. We did. I ran back upstairs, pretty much white as he was, and scared to death. He looked frightened, very frightened and shocked. My wife? pretty much freaked out as much as I was, because, like, that doesn't happen every day. <laughs> you don't just see a head floating in the air. It took a long time for me to get over that. That was a very scary episode. In some cases, um, an individual may only see a portion of the body of the spirit, such as a head or the body or the legs, because that's all that that spirit is capable of manifesting with the energy they have. Then the activity took a darker and more dangerous turn and started to target Wayne and Darcy. I started to wake up and I knew that Wayne had already gotten up because I heard the television just lightly. I tried to move just to get up like you normally would and push the covers off, and I couldn't move. <laughs> After
After a terrifying apparition appeared in her home, Darcy Tripp became the focus of the paranormal activity. And now, it had taken a darker turn. It felt like something was completely on my entire body from my neck down. I couldn't move. My arms were on top of me and I was on my back and I could feel the blankets around me and I didn't know what was going on and I started to panic. And I tried to call out for Wayne, but nothing, I couldn't get enough air in to get a noise out. And I tried to call his name, and I could just get a little bit of, of a grunt out, not very loud. All of a sudden, I heard sort of screaming, sort of moaning, coming from the upstairs. So I went running up the stairs. <laughs> It, it looked like something was laying on top of her when I first walked in. I was very afraid from that happening because that was the first, um, what I consider some sort of an attack or something negative. Yeah, it freaked me out pretty good. I feel that it was getting personal at that point. Unable to take it anymore, Wayne and Darcy contacted a team of paranormal investigators. We were looking for validation. We were looking for other people to witness, of course, things that we have. So the paranormal team were in our bedroom, and they were asking for a sign or for somebody to show something for them. like somebody walked in the door and then up the stairs to the second floor. Oh, gosh. Hot here, guys. The lead investigator, um, he started to sweat profusely and they could tell from their equipment that the temperature in the bedroom had went up at least five degrees. He had to leave the bedroom and come downstairs to get rid of that sensation. Undeterred, the investigators continued trying to reveal exactly what was plaguing the house. They had some knocks, some bangs, um, shadow movement in the dining room. They were getting ready to come down to the basement. Did you hear that? Yeah. I heard that. And you heard a voice in a Scottish accent. It sounded like he said, Bendy Rabbit. In the conversation, it didn't make sense. But once they took it back to their place and played it over and over again, Somebody there said, play that part backwards. I don't have anything. You hear the EVP, and Bendy Rabbit becomes, I don't have anything. And when they played that for us, oh, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. The voice completely validated that we knew that something was here and that we weren't, um, we were of sound mind. We, we knew there was something here. It just made me feel that I'm not crazy. This is really happening. In an unusual move, Wayne and Darcy decided to publicize their experience in the local newspaper and ask the public for help. We actually went to this the Sarnia paper and put it out there 
and there was a big write-up. The family members of the family that lived here came to us with their opinion of who the Scottish gentleman's voice might be on our EVP. And their mom and dad that lived here had a border, and the border was Scottish. It sounds weird, um, but we have no intention of leaving right now. Until recently, nothing really was personal. It's just something trying to let us know what was here. Darcy and Wayne are still living in peace with their ghost, at least for now. Coming face to face with a ghost is a disturbing experience. But when an obsessive demonic entity watches your every move, your relationships, your mental health, even your life could be at risk. Okay, uh, Paranormal Survivor 2, Beth's Haunted Garage. Take one. The house was under foreclosure when we purchased it and um, moving from a small uptown apartment, uh, it was extremely appealing for just the outdoor lifestyle we could lead. When we came into the garage uh, for the first time, it had been abandoned for quite some time and it always gave me an uneasy feeling. It's always been kind of menacing. Because of that feeling, Beth generally stayed away from the garage. But her boyfriend spent most of his time there, using the upstairs as a jam space. He had been in here with a group of his bandmates. And when they took a break, they actually heard like satanic prayer music coming through the speaker system. And this was kind of like an ungodly preaching to Satan, asking for Satan's children to join this fold. They were completely freaked out by the entire situation. Slowly after that, the band eventually broke up and, and the jamming kind of stopped in here. Beth even felt uncomfortable whenever she was in view of the garage. I would feel the presence of, of somebody watching me through the window every night when I was home alone. It would draw my eye. in the garage one day and everything was turned off and he had come inside the house and grabbed a drink of water. Beth Shaw and her boyfriend had started to experience weird things in their garage. And when he came back outside, everything was going, and it had been going for a few minutes, and he was just distraught. He kept it to himself that day. He didn't tell me about it. Spirits tend to do many things to try to get your attention because the living do not always pay attention. So they will go to sometimes drastic measures. And because electronic items 
are so easy for them to manipulate, that's usually where they'll start. Eventually, Beth and her boyfriend broke up. And when he left, he had a warning for her. When he moved out, he actually pulled me aside and let me know that when he was here, he experienced several different paranormal activities happening in front of him. But at the time, he knew how I'd feel about it. But he told me when he sat me down and, and let me know that something might be concerning to me if I'm here alone. Looking for answers, Beth sought the help of a psychic. I was feeling extremely afraid and uh, alone, and so I, it prompted me to kind of want to dig into it further and see if there was something out here. I had gone to a psychic uh, in town. that she could see a man staring at me through a broken window. And when she said that, a chill ran through my entire core. When you look upon my garage from my window, you see a window that I personally installed, and it's not broken, but there's a split screen in the window. So it appears to be broken from the outside. And she just said that he had very ill intent um, towards me and that I should watch out. He wasn't a good spirit, and he was, you know, kind of standing lord over the land that I was currently on by myself. Evil spirits, negative spirits, or even demonic spirits will often uh, derive either pleasure or joy from terrorizing an individual, and they may go further than that to try to destroy that individual. I thought it would be kind of intriguing to have people over and do a seance. And we had a big bonfire after the seance, and there was probably about 20 or 30 people here. It was beautiful, beautiful night, no wind, beautiful fire. I woke up several hours later and I looked in back where we had all been haphazardly sitting around the bonfire and not in any formation at all. And all of my chairs had been laid down in a semicircle in front of the fire pit with one chair standing alone. And it completely freaked me out. I took pictures of the event when it happened. Uh, I contacted my, my close friend Diana, who had started up the Loyalist City Paranormal Society. I was kind of taken aback because I wasn't expecting a haunted garage for my first investigation. I figured it would be a house, and I was sort of um, unique in that way that it was a, a garage that uh, was causing the issues. We had our night vision cameras pointed towards the window, and so we wanted to make sure that um, we could see the room clearly without the light interference. Um, we found a tarp so we um, sort of maneuvered it onto the window. We had one camera that was shooting. And you can hear us leaving and go out into the, into the backyard. And then all of a sudden, you see the tarp fall off the window. And you can hear footsteps clearly walking away from where the tarp was. You can almost hear what sounds like a breathing in the background. The window had a vapor lock over top of it. And uh, you can see sort of what looked like a hand pushing the um, corner of the vapor lock slowly and then just letting go again. It was really um, actually quite scary. Soon, the investigators would feel the spirit's hand themselves.
Strange things were happening in Beth Shaw's garage. And since calling in paranormal investigators, things had gotten even worse. One of our investigators was actually touched on the leg. Um, and she was, she felt as if she was poked. I was terrified. I was terrified when I heard that. Um, I didn't one thing to have a spirit that's actually able that you can physically see, but that it can physically assault you was, uh, it was a whole different realm. Once the recording devices were set up, Diana and her team decided to try to communicate with the spirit. So the ghost box is sort of an experimental tool that we use, and uh, it was invented to um, create sort of a white noise, which gave the spirits a medium to speak through. It's um, like real-time EVPs, so you're asking questions and you're getting a response, hopefully, right away. Every time that I started the ghost box, you could hear noises upstairs. So we'd start it just about getting ready to ask questions, and then we'd hear a bang upstairs. So we'd turn it off and, um, and say, who's up there? And um, can you do that again? And then we would hear nothing. As soon as we turned the ghost box back on again, you would hear another bang, turn it off, and the same thing over and over again. It's almost as if it was playing games with us. They came with the intent to catch something, and I think that they did. And then we started asking questions. We had asked a lot of questions. We were asking if it was uh, male or female. And then eventually we just, we said, you know, is there, um, do you have something that you want to say to Beth? And it gave us a clear yes. So we immediately stopped and, and went over to get her. I was extremely uneasy. Die. I was able to hear a man's raspy voice. Die, Beth, die. Say my name and say, like, die, Beth, die. <laughs> Specific words that you kind of, like, like, gone and die and Beth, and it was just very specific things to kind of make me very afraid of, of this place. When we heard it, I was, um, all of us, I think, were kind of unnerved by it. And we all felt that, you know, it's, it's really sort of um, like honing in on Beth. And that's like, it, it was kind of worrying us that it was almost obsessed. So um, we were asking about Beth's ex-partner. And we asked, did, um, did you like this guy? And on the ghost box, Immediately afterwards, you hear, it sounds like it says, kicked him out. So basically, it, it was in that same male voice, he was saying, you know, like, I didn't want him here, so I drove him away. I was extremely overwhelmed when I heard that. I was extremely emotional. Our psychic medium had mentioned that um, she could tell that the, the spirit was not human, it was not of uh, human nature. And um, she had said that it was very negative. I think she actually called it a nasty. She felt really um, that it was fixated on Beth. And um, we need to clear it and, uh, and get it away from Beth, basically. Fearing what the entity would do next if left unchecked, Beth wanted it gone. The entity was sort of attached to the land, so she felt it necessary to have a clearing. She set up boundaries, buried some crystals around um, the property, and, uh, and asked that it, that it keep away. It's almost like putting up a fence. And she almost felt as if it was playing games at times with us. And while she was doing the clearing, she said she could sort of like feel like he was outside, kind of uh, like upset that it was being asked to stay away and uh, sort of um, 
like taunting and trying to intimidate her. The entire time she was here cleansing the area, I felt like a force was pushing forward, just pushing forward the whole time. The next morning, it felt like like a, like a new, like after a fresh rain, it just felt like a new place. I was absolutely terrified when this was all going down. The garage for us was definitely one of the, the creepiest investigations that we've ever done. Um, this is one of the ones that stands out and we always talk about. I had actually gone and revisited the first psychic and she, without me even prompting, she immediately told me that the spirit was now contained, that it wouldn't be able to bother me anymore, and it couldn't, it couldn't move and it couldn't harm me anymore. 